it occurred to me years later how many shows we did and what kind of writing we had and the kind of chances that we took. I still can't believe we did it. I suppose if I were given the opportunity, I'd do the same thing again. It seems to me that that's the kind, if you're going to do an anthology, which that was, that's the kind of anthology to do. You do a little bit of everything. You take all kinds of chances. Remember the one we did called Conrad in Quest of His Youth? There was a magnificent show. Fred Steiner did music for it. Just lovely love story. E. Jack wrote a dozen fantastic original stories. Shirley Gordon did such good stuff. She did a thing called Call Me a Cab. Yeah. Remember that? Yes. Yeah. She did a lot of good stuff. As radio audiences left for TV, Lewis continued to express his belief that radio was a stronger dramatic medium. On Thursday, January 1st, 1953, Elliot and his wife, Kathy, debuted a new dramatic anthology program over CBS Airwaves called On Stage. Kathy Lewis, for her part, was not only appearing in a variety of dramatic radio productions, but was also simul co-starring on TV and radio in My Friend Irma. On Stage was geared for adults, showcasing an eclectic array of scripts across multiple genres. To get the show off the ground, the Lewises tabbed some of the best writers in radio, like E. Jack Newman. I want to talk to you a bit about the Kathy and Elliot Lewis show on stage. When you think of that series, which I think is one of the absolute high points of radio, how do you remember that series? Very fondly, of course. And it was in really the uh, waning days of radio. Because television was obviously going to move in and move in big and supplant radio drama as we knew it. But in that year and that time, and particularly with on stage, radio really grew up and put on long pants. It became very adult and very sophisticated and very satisfying. I was lucky enough to write a dozen or so of the on stage with Kathy and Elliot Lewis. Really, it was a free ball. Elliot was a magnificent producer and director and performer. I could discuss dramatically very mature subjects and very mature themes, and I did with no holds barred, and it was a marvelous experience for me as a writer, and I'll, I'll never regret the time and effort I put into it. Stories would be rooted in powerful male-female situations, with two characters of equal strength being the main goal. They used a mix of classic and original tales, cutting across all dramatic disciplines, with mysteries, adventures, melodramas, satires, and comedy. Kathy was the perfect female foil, not just because she was Elliot's real-life wife, but because she was a superb actress, able to play any role with a methodology similar to those who are members of the actor's studio. The goal was to make each character as close to life as possible. Kathy was a consummate actress, of course, beautiful woman. As I recall her, she was very gracious, kind, and very, very competent in her profession. I remember she made a uh, aside from her enormous success as a radio actress, she was also on a long-run television show, uh, My Friend Irma. Yeah, on radio and TV. I always liked Kathy and always got along with her very well. I can't say that has happened with every actress I've worked with since. <laughs> it helped that the West Coast group of actors were like a family. A frequent co-star was Byron Kane. It was all on-the-job training. It started in that backyard of Richard Pettuccini when I said to my other friend, oh yes, I will go over. I walked over to KMPC against the wall with high Aberback, and away I went. That was really the first thing. Why I was able to do it, I can only say Mother Nature gave me that gift. I was. I have theories, of course, about acting, and as, as many years have passed, I've talked to younger actors and 
told me about their desires and their systems and the methods and the things, and I could go on for hours about that. I think a fine actor or actress, I believe I know, a fine actor or actress is born. You don't learn to be a fine actress. You can learn on the job and learn tricks. Oh my God, the mistakes I've made, of course, of course. But the Lorene Tuttles, whoever, however she started, no one has to tell me. She was born, and I could go to the list of the people that you could remind me of that I've forgotten. On Wednesday, September 30th, 1953, at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, the episode they broadcast was entitled Loving. It co-starred Kane with William Conrad, Barney Phillips, Clayton Post, and was announced by George Walsh. Do you remember the princely sum of money, perhaps, that you made as an announcer for a network radio program in those days? For a program? Yeah. Forty bucks. Does that compare with the memories of Jack Crucian and Shirley Mitchell? And hey, glad to get it. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> Pay has gone up over the years. Yeah, talking, now we get $42. Forty two dollars. Forty two fifty. You're looking at three scale workers here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was the last voice on the format of suspense, known to my daughters in those days who were pretty small as Spooky Daddy. Spooky, Spooky Daddy. Daddy. Yeah, that's <laughs> did, you, did you ever use the voice, like, for disciplinary purposes? Never worked. Never worked, Never worked huh? Yep. They, knew. they laughed at you, didn't yeah. they, George? <laughs> Are today's announcers, do you think, George, is as good as they were back in the golden days of radio? Well, I don't think they were announcers in the same sense as they were in those days. I think today they're all doing commercials. There's hardly any such thing as a format announcer anymore. Hardly any such thing as a staff announcer anymore. That's right. and Elliot Lewis on stage. <laughs> Kathy Lewis, Elliot Lewis, two of the most distinguished names in radio, appearing each week in their own theater, starring in a repertory of transcribed stories of their own and your choosing. Radio's foremost players in radio's foremost plays. Ladies and gentlemen, Elliot Lewis. Good evening. May I present my wife, Kathy? Good evening. To date here on stage, we've done all the types of plays that George Walsh describes every week in his very flattering opening announcement. But there's one type of play he always leaves out, because it's not really a play. It's a series of fragments, a series of short, short stories. But three short, short stories, fragments, should have something in common. A title, an idea, a manner of presentation. And so tonight we present Loving by Arthur Ross. Three short plays about, well, listen. Perhaps there are only three kinds of people in the world. Those who are loved, those who are unloved, and the self-loved. In miniature portrait, in small detail of the small moments of each of the three loves, we shall tell of just such a world divided into three parts. Our first story is about the self-loved. If there are 100 great actresses in the world, Jan Martin is not one of them. But if there are 100 beautiful women in the world, Jan can be counted among their number. That's why she has no illusions about her fame as a motion picture actress. She made sure excellent actors supported her, making it seem their talent was hers. Bitterly and angrily, she clung to each step forward in her career. 
And with equal anger, she fought anything which seemed to detract from her beauty on the screen, or anyone who seemed to be attracting more attention than she in her pictures. Her life was as delicate as a prime minister's or a secretary of state. Each move had to be well calculated for its appearance as well as its result. This had not helped the progress of her latest picture or her relations with the leading man who played opposite her, a man she had been sincerely in love with since the middle of January when he had won an Academy Award. But this was June, toward the end of the day and the end of the picture. Darling, be a dear, call my wardrobe girl. She's right there, just signaling. You're not being very sweet. Janet's late. I'm tired, you're tired. Never mind. Edith, honey, be a darling. Throw this up, will you? Ed, how was it? Well, it uh, could have had a little more honesty to it. It seemed uh, indifferent instead of subdued, you know? I was doing exactly the way you told me to, Eddie. Exactly. I didn't mean for you to do it exactly as I described it, Jan. Well, what do you mean, really, Eddie? What do you mean? Don't get excited, Jan. We're getting a couple of more takes on it. You're not helping me much, not at all. I tried. This is the most important scene I've got, and you keep pulling me down in it. The best love scene. You don't... You, you just don't... I've been considered a competent actor by several qualified people. Now, don't give me that broad A routine, sweetheart. This isn't Broadway. You're not doing Ibsen, honey. All right, that's a take. Now, will you try to be a little more considerate? Like what? Like moving back toward the chair just a little. I'll get off the scene completely. How's that? That's a take. Not very quiet. Quiet! Roll them. Speed. Action. Can you forgive me? I never judged you. I have no need to forgive you. Because you weren't like them, as cruel as they were. You never hurt me. Why did they want to hurt me? What had I done that I... Oh, I forgot that rotten line again. All right, cut it. I always forget that line. It's a terrible line. I just can't say it. We have to change that line, honey. No time to, Jan. We'll take it again. Well, Tom, it's that move that I make to you. you. You just have to get back toward the chair. You have it to. It takes two people to play this scene. What do you mean? I thought it was obvious. You're assuming an awful lot, honey, just because of our relationship. Do we have one? We must have. I've never, never put up with so much from a leading man. You seem to be the only one with a problem in this picture. Oh, Look, honey, let's not fight. Just be a darling. What does it hurt? Be a darling and move back just a few feet, just for this scene. It's a love scene, Jan. That wouldn't make it very intimate. But it would play better. Can you play a love scene alone? Now, just a minute. I guess if anyone can, you can. Now, you just... Are you going to move back? Hold it. Hold it! What? Jan, is there something wrong? Uh, no... No. Okay. Roll them. Speed. Action. Can you forgive me? I never judged you. I don't have the need to forgive you. Because you weren't like them, as cruel as they were. You never hurt me. Why did they want to hurt me? What had I done that made them hate me so? What had... Oh, I can't. I can't do that line. Right, cut it. I won't do that line. How do you want to change, Jack? Oh, well, darling, really. Uh, do you think it's playable? Well, let's leave that way in rehearsal. Well, then maybe it isn't the line. How so? <sighs> maybe. Maybe it's the way we're placed, honey. I, I'm not criticizing you, but but uh, now look, just look. I, I wind up like a lady wrestler. Uh, what do you suggest? Well, if I moved up, just up, just a little bit. No, no, no. That that's too awkward. Uh, Tom. Or if I move back a bit. Would you mind? We're behind schedule. Okay. Ah, you're a darling. You're a real darling, huh? Save your emotion for the scene. What? Save your affection for the scene. It's a little more credible there. All right, be a sorehead. Be mad. I'm not mad at you, Jan. 
I've just had enough of your petulant, selfish childishness. All right, all right, all right, if that's the way you feel. And I do. Well, you certainly have deep feelings yourself. I hope so. You love me, but when I ask for a favor, it's too much of a sacrifice. You've asked for them all the way through the picture. I'm a woman, you're a man. You're supposed to be an adult, too. As the star, I'm entitled to some extra consideration. It's all yours. What? The picture isn't finished, but we are. Well, if you think that's going to make me come begging... Of course not. You're self-sufficient, Jan. You don't need anyone but yourself. And don't you envy Let me put it another way. You're not capable of wanting anybody but yourself. <laughs> All right, stop that! Stop it right now! It's all right. I want to finish this scene if she does. I... Of course I do. All right. Roll them. Fire. Speed. Action. Can you forgive me? I never judged you. I don't have any need to forgive you. Because you weren't like them, as cruel as they were. You never hurt me. Why did they want to hurt me? What had I done that made them hate me so? What did they want? To be loved the way you're loved. Oh, yes. Yes. Cut! Print it! By the fall of 1953, William Conrad was in his second year as Matt Dillon on Gunsmoke. Although he was one of radio's busiest veterans, he'd just turned 33 years old only three days prior. He was equally at home in both starring and supporting roles. Oh, I don't know. I was fascinated with radio uh, when I was a kid. I had to go to work very early. My father died when I was, I think, 15. I had a dear friend who was an announcer on one of the local stations, and I used to hang around with him at night, and uh, he'd let me... This is long before AFTRA, or AFRA. He'd let me do a commercial every now and then, and that fascinated me, and then... I went to a radio station called KMPC and started working. Uh, I stayed there for a long, long time. I don't know. I was just... Uh, it's the only thing I could figure to do at that point in my life. The first story about the self-love. The second story is about the unloved. Perhaps one of the reasons the San Joaquin Valley in Central California is such a great farming area is because of the intense summer sun. The crops seem to rush to full growth in a frantic effort to be free of the intense heat. And so it was in the Army Hospital Ward in which Bucko worked. Other ward boys had long since wilted, but Bucko worked on, his 200-pound body scurrying and hurrying to help and assist. His overlong arms, which extended two inches below the cuffs of his wrinkled jacket, offered cool drinks to the sick and the unhappy soldier patients. The extra effort... The extra service which no other ward boy offered always obtained for Bucko a friendly, grateful word from the patient. And then his ugliness, the high, incredibly high domed forehead and small, deep-set eyes, the jowly face, the odd, almost distorted face seemed to brighten and look happy. To be wanted, to be liked so genuinely made up in many ways for the cruel jibes of his fellow ward boys. Hiya, Romeo. Getting set for the knock I'm dead in town tonight? I'm meeting some friends. I got some friends in town. Modest boy. Modest boy. I hear you're lining up one of those daughters of a rich farmer. Don't talk like that. What's wrong? We get just greasy spoon chow in town, but you get good cooking. Future son-in-law always gets good cooking. I know one of the girls, but she only thanked me. Her brother was a patient here, and she thanked me for being nice to him. Is that the one you're talking about? That one? <laughs> no, sir, bucko. 
All of them. All of them. What's he got that we ain't got? Whatever it is, who needs it? <laughs> Going to buy sale, you? Yeah, get in. you with medical corps most guys just say medic you say the whole thing i guess maybe it means more to me you going to regular army when this is over well, i mean i'm going to medical school after i get out of service takes a long time i'm not doing it alone my wife's going to help me that's the way my wife wouldn't help me with nothing Nagging all the time, asking, asking, never helping. How long you been married? I'm not married yet. We're going to get married in a couple of months. It'll change then. The whole thing, no help, nothing. No, sir. Not Alice. Not Alice and me. She loves me enough to work and help out and wait. You're lucky, soldier. I am. I'm lucky to have a girl like Alice in love with me. Thanks a lot, mister. No, no more for me. I'm... I'm sorry I'm late. It's okay. Is there any place you'd like to go? No. We can go into Fresno and have a good dinner. I said no. Can't you get that? It's bad enough my meeting you here all the time. It don't hurt to meet me here. The other girls, they kid me. They make fun of me meeting you. They think I like you. Don't you? They mean like you a lot. I'm sorry, Alice. Maybe I got just enough of this. It don't hurt you any to be with me a while. The other girls make fun of me. Well, who are they? Nobody. Nothing. Drunks and all. What difference does it make whatever they think? Well, they're important to me because I see them all the time. You don't. All you got to do once or twice a week is sit with me and drink beer and go to dinner or maybe go for a walk. And listen. Listen all the time to the same talk. We don't do no hurt to you to listen. I know your life story so good I could tell you. Don't talk like that. Don't make me sore at you. You're threatening me. You're threatening me. I'll clear out of so, so fast it'll make your head no, swim. No, no. I didn't mean that. No. I didn't mean that at all. I'd never hurt you. And don't I pay you to listen? To just listen and pretend? Does it do you any hurt or anybody? Okay. I want to talk about it tonight, Alice. I want to tell you it's been tough for me. My pa, a big, tough man who never wanted to see me when my ma died. I was scared of him, and I loved him. Someday, when I'm a doctor, maybe I'll be a children's doctor. When I'm a doctor, I'll find out how you can love somebody and be scared of them, too. He loved you, Bucko. Maybe he did. You think so? You think he did? I don't know. I've been knocking around so long. So much. Picking crops and all. You know I picked crops before the army? Yeah, I know. I'm beginning to forget all that happened. I don't want to. Going up and down the valley, picking lettuce and tomatoes and grapes. Everything. The things I seen, Alice. I said seen again. But my English is better than it was, isn't it? Isn't it? I guess so. It takes an education to meet the right people, to be liked every place. And best of all is being a doctor. Doctors are really liked. Their patients, 
almost love him for helping him and all. I don't want to hear any more. You're sore at me. I don't care if you do pay me ten bucks to just sit and listen. I want to have fun. I'll take you any place you want to go. I only use my money to take you out, Alice. You're no fun. You make me feel funny. Like I'm all alone, like both of us are. I don't like that. You're not alone. Give me the creeps. You never laugh. I only want you to say it to me, Alice. I'm going. There's the ten dollars, Alice. I... Please. I... Love you, bucko. That's why you fight with me? That's why you always want to run away? That's why... Say it real, Alice. I love you, Bucko. Good night, Alice. Good night. Never call me again. Never. Noble, Fred Steiner, and Lud Gluskin's music beautifully fit the production, and the sound patterns by Ross Murray and Burns Surrey were exceptional. You are listening to Kathy and Elliot Lewis on stage. Tonight's play, Loving. He's Hoosier's great gift to radio, Herb Schreiner, and he's about to be yours every Saturday night on CBS Radio's new delightful audience participation quiz, Two for the Money. This Saturday, be sure to take in the colorful premiere of Herb Schreiner's new show on CBS Radio, you love every minute of Two for the Money. Now to bring our stories of loving to a logical conclusion, our last story about the loved one. Are you too old? Is the memory too dim to remember the first time you said, I love you? Are you too young? Hasn't the rapturous, tormented, beautiful moment come to you yet? Are you just old enough for it to have just happened? To have whispered the lyrical words in front of a crackling fire, a water's edge, a tree-spired hill? Or has it all happened before? Too many times before, so the words become metallic and the emotion only a gesture out of respect to your companion's feelings. No matter, the magic moment of the first time you said it is still there. Bob Rose and Sally Davis, young college loves, had started as others had before. There was no trumpeting to herald this as any different from those which had preceded it. And they were too sophisticated to succumb to this deepest of feelings. For he was in law school, and she was an undergraduate. For he was soon to become a lawyer, and she a Bachelor of Arts. For they had discussed everything. Everything. Politics, religion, art, philosophy, literature, the mechanical age, and the Elizabethan era. Everything had been said except one thing. Wonderful party. Fine party. What's wrong? Nothing. You don't have to bite my head off. Bite your head off? What did I say? I simply said nothing was wrong. All right. Why are you sitting way over there? Over where? On the opposite side. I'm sitting right next to you. Right next to you. Maybe we have a different idea of what right next to one means. It's relative, you know. Relative to what? To how you feel. I feel very affectionate. <laughs> That's better. What a beautiful night. I'll hate to leave here. So will I. A graduate student shouldn't have such sentimental attachments to a school. I suppose undergraduate students are something strange. Well, I just meant that I'm getting ready to take the bar exam and, and uh, 
<laughs> and it's different. The rah-rah uh, spirit isn't quite the same. What's wrong with sentiment? Oh, nothing, but it isn't really honest emotion. It'll do until something better comes along. Well, that's all it should be, a stopgap until the real thing does come along. Hmm. You going right into practice, or are you going to vacation first? Oh, I have to go right into practice. The spot that was offered to me, if I don't grab it right away, they'll give it to somebody else. Oh. Well, what's wrong? Nothing. Well, something must be wrong. Why? Well, the way you said, oh... What's wrong? Nothing's wrong. Nothing at all. Okay. Yes, something is wrong. What? You. You seem to be so contentious. You, you always seem to find something to argue about. Me? You weren't that way when we first started going out. I thought you were doing the same thing. How do you expect me to react when you jump on every word I say? Well, maybe I'm just following your lead. This is where I live. Okay, I'll stop the car. It's easy. You don't have to see me, in. Don't be foolish. I'm not being foolish. The lights are on and you can watch from the car. You don't have to see me, in. Sally. Yes? Uh... Want a cigarette first before you go in? No, thanks. Well, how come? I just don't want one. You've always had a last cigarette with me since our first date. Maybe I just don't feel like one. But if you want one, go ahead. Would you prefer it if I didn't call you again? What? If that's what you want? I didn't say it's what I want. But it does seem to be what you want. I didn't say I don't want to see you again. But you act like it all night long. You've been acting strange. That's all. Like what? Tell me. Go ahead and tell me. You mentioned it earlier at the party. Just tell me what I did that, that, that was so strange. Well, you didn't pay much attention to me, for one thing. You sat off by yourself kind of brooding all evening. Well, I, I wanted to spend time with you. It seems all we've done is go out with other couples or, or, or to parties. You like them, too. They're mutual friends, not just mine. Okay, okay, okay. Look, you don't have to see me if you don't want to. Nobody makes you call me for a date. Are you seeing somebody else? Of course. You, you don't think I'm just going out with you? You know that. Oh, I meant, are you very serious about any of those other guys? That's pretty personal. Well, maybe it is. But I, I just want to know if you want to see me. If I'm intruding or complicating things for you, I'd just like to know. Well, I... You're not complicating things, Bob. <laughs> for a fellow who, whose whole career is based on logic, <laughs> I'm not very logical at, at times. <laughs> oh, yeah. Both been a little funny lately, I guess. I'll miss you, Sally. You'll be busy working. Listen, Sally. Listen. I think I'm going to miss seeing you, too. I... I'm very fond of you. And I like you a lot. I do. I... I'll miss you terribly. More than I ever thought I could miss anyone. Bob. I love you, Sally. I love you. I love you, I love Bob. You. I love you. I love you, Sally. Bob, how I love you. On stage came at a bittersweet time in Kathy and Elliot Lewis's lives. Even as CBS referred to them as Mr. and Mrs. Radio, 
their marriage of 10 years was in trouble. They'd remained together throughout most of the 1950s, but divorced in 1959. Elliot would soon marry another noteworthy actress, Mary Jane Croft. Loving, starring Kathy and Elliot Lewis on stage. In a moment, Mr. and Mrs. Lewis will tell you about next week's play. CBS Radio unveils its sparkling new production, Stage Struck, this Friday night. It's an exciting, colorful visit to Broadway with the greats of show business. This Friday, your host, Mike Wallace, takes you to meet Rosalind Russell, Shirley Booth, Basil Rathbone, and many others. Remember, Friday night on most of these same stations, go stage struck with CBS Radio. And now, once again, Kathy and Elliot Lewis. While Kathy was an actress who loved herself, William Conrad was the patient motion picture director. And when Elliot felt himself unloved, Clayton Post and Byron Kane taunted him. And Barney Phillips drove him into town in his truck. A few weeks passed, we did a play by E. Jack Newman called The Crustacean. And as always happens with one of E. Jack Newman's scripts, your response was either loud applause or noisy catcalls. But there's no way to play it safe in show business. You can't please everyone. As a matter of fact, if you take the argument out of drama, you have nothing left but unrelated words. And so, because this is that kind of a show, next week, another new play by E. Jack Newman. This one about an ex-football player who was called the Great Dane. Until next week, thank you for listening. Good night. Good night. And Elliot Lewis was... He would have been just an the inspired other director yes, as well a, as a perfectly mm-hmm. wonderful oh, yeah. actor. Yes. But he was a wonderful actor. A magnificent actor. director. Mm-hmm. Very easy. So yes. maybe just the opposite of a Bill Robeson approach. Well, he was quiet, mm-hmm. wasn't he? No, he was he got things done. Music for tonight's story was composed and conducted by Fred Steiner. The Kathy and Elliot theme is by Ray Noble. And the program is transcribed and directed by Mr. Lewis. George Walsh speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. I found a box that Elliot had with little cards and all alphabetized. What it was, this is how orderly he was. Starting in 1937, I'm cherishing this box of cards. It had every show he did. What it paid, $3 yes. an yes. hour. <laughs> That's right, $5. Calling All Cars was one of them. What, some of the early ones. Yes, right. God, I can't Tapestries remember. Tapestries of Life. Yeah, all of these a, things. That and it did. goes all the way through, and every week he totaled it up. But the thing that fascinated me was the names of all these shows and how much they paid. Yes, right. <laughs> Three dollars and That's a half. That's right.